Um, well, I can begin. Uh, my area um, of expertise, or my er the area that I've been working in for a number of years now, um, is uh, falls under the umbrella of human resources, if anyone's familiar with uh, that area. There are a number of um, fields uh, within human resources, and for me, my focus has always been in uh, training and development. And certainly, uh, having a background in creativity and creative problem solving has been absolutely critical in that area. One of the things, and I uh, made a note to write it down because I wanted to remember it, um, is the, the task analysis piece. Um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I work with uh, many, many organizations. Um, every single day, I work with a different organization. Some of them are for-profit, some are non-for-profit, um, uh, some are government agencies, um, and uh, across industry lines. So I've worked within manufacturing, healthcare, um, uh, retailing, uh, financial services, you name it, we've pretty much done it. Uh, and so the task analysis piece is just, uh, I think, critical to really help you clarify what's happening. Because a lot of times people think they know what the problem is uh, when they call you in, and they usually call you in, uh, you know, when their back is up against the wall. Uh, but when they call you in, they think they know what the issue is, but until you really take them through a task analysis, they don't know. I would have to say that probably 75, 80 percent of the time, they really don't have a complete uh, picture, global picture of what's happening and what they really need. So that's, that's a critical piece. The other thing, too, I think within uh, training and development um, is that uh, in my position, uh, I'm juggling a lot of, um, a lot of schedules, whether it's organizational schedules, whether it's trainer schedules, and there are always problems that come up. So, of course, being able to just kind of sit back and say, okay, now this problem has happened how many times? Let's make sure that we really fix this. And, you know, CPS really comes in very, very handy uh, with my team. I tend to involve everybody, you know, in the process. So that's, that's extremely, um, extremely important. Um, the other thing, too, is that I stress with uh, my clients um, the value and the need, the critical need for creative problem solving skills for their people, not just their leadership, but also um, first line supervision and staff. And we've been fortunate, Sue uh, has helped me on some occasions, um, and other members of the faculty have helped as well, where we were able to um, go in and deliver creative problem solving training to um, either upper level leadership, first line supervision, and just recently we were able to deliver it to um, the entire staff uh, within an organization. And that just can be so very powerful. So that's, um, that's how I've used it, and I'm sure there are lots of other ways uh, that I'm just not thinking of right this second. Um, as far as the, the, the easiest and the hardest aspects of the journey, I would have to say it's been very, very easy to stay enthusiastic uh, and stay very positive and stay very interested uh, in the whole field of creativity and creative problem solving. What's been more difficult, um, uh, I think, is to be able to um, kind of go out uh, into the outside world and help people to really understand what creativity is all about. You know, it's not uh, standing barefoot finger painting, you know. It's something extremely critical. It really, it's a life skill. Uh, if you think about it. To me, it's a core skill, like reading, writing, math. Um, but I think we still have some you know, ways to go to really get people to, to understand that. So I would have to say that um, my work in trying to, I guess, quote unquote, mainstream that uh, creativity in CPS, um, you know, uh, has taken a lot longer than I thought. But I think together we can really make some inroads. So. You know, one of the things that we have students do is we'll, we'll ask them, you know, if you're going out and you're going to pitch it, yeah. what are some things you would say? Yeah, do you have some, speech. some yep. things that you say to... Well, to be perfectly honest, I don't usually use the word creativity until I've already kind of broken them in <laughs> to the whole concept. I use the word innovation. Mm. Uh, and we talk mm. about uh, making people more uh, productive, um, uh, impacting uh, morale and retention. You have to understand, I work in an organizational setting, and so they ha I have to give them reasons 
to bring us in and give them reasons um, to uh, have the training delivered because they're paying wages when folks are sitting in this and it could run in the tens of thousands of dollars for them on top of what they pay us to deliver the training. So um, if you look at it from their perspective, uh, it, you have to make it very um, clear, you have to speak in their language, whatever their language happens to be, um, and then you have to f try to figure out what's in it for them. Uh, and that, that usually uh, works, but just using the term innovation, uh, you know, and innovation, um, as far as I'm concerned, I always couple innovation with continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. That's what you do, you know, when you're, whether you're out um, on, the, uh, on a manufacturing shop floor or you're in a hospital uh, and you're trying to, uh, you know, manage an emergency room, it really doesn't matter what you're doing. We all know that the process can be overlaid on just about anything. Uh, you know, at all. Uh, but uh, it's very, very important that, that folks understand that this innovation thing um, is not warm and fuzzy. It's very hard. It's very beneficial. They'll see it on the bottom line. And so I usually do couple the term innovation, continuous improvement, productivity, and so forth. And that seems to work. That, that catches them. Once I've got them, then we can talk about creativity. And, uh, you know, and, and that works. It was really interesting to, to work with you and actually co-create it yep. with the clients, mm -hmm. yes. you know, and really make it fit their culture yes. to the yes. to the best degree we could. Yes. Well, and that's that's what I do. That's what we do, and that's really um, what I demand of my staff. We customize everything because you have to. Even if you're looking at two manufacturers, you know, you look at, let's say, you know, GM and Chrysler. Well, they all, you know, manufacture cars, but they're all very different. Their cultures are different. That's, that's a consideration. What is the culture? So how do we approach this? And you may, you may work with both clients and introduce creative problem solving to both clients, but you'll do it in very distinctly different ways. You know, so it's very important that you keep that in mind. There really isn't a cookie cutter, off the shelf, you know, way to do it. The process is the process is the process. And Sue and I have talked a lot about just trust the process, it's <laughs> gonna work, and it does, it yeah. does. But within that process, you really have to be very sensitive to the needs of your clients, um, or maybe it's your own organization, you know, the place where you work. Uh, but it's very important to remember. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> I can take it away from there. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Great. I think my focus and what I what I feel I, I took away um, mostly from the program and into my um, professional life is more focus on the um, my myself as a, as a creative person, and I think going into the um, teaching graduate students and these these are teachers that are out there um, wanting to bring out that creativity in their students. Um, my focus has been on helping them understand themselves as a creative person. And it's amazing to me. Um, I just actually a wonderful part of being a, the director of the program is I get to um, create an elective if I want to. And of course, when I had that chance, <laughs> yeah. it was well, you know what it's going to be. It's <laughs> DI and how it relates to creativity. And um, it's it's just an amazing an amazing experience to be teaching something that you're so passionate about. And I do feel like the creativity is um, is a passion of mine, as I know it is probably everybody in here. Um, it's just kind of finding what that niche is for you. And I feel like this is a real niche. So um, the first class I had with, with um, my graduate students and two weeks ago, it was just um, amazing to me how so many of them still will say, I don't have a creative bone in my body. Mm -hmm. You know, and it just, and having gone through the pro program, you know, you kind of get that out of your system pretty much early on, you know, because <laughs> you kind of learn otherwise that that's not the case. Um, but it's so important for me to instill in them um, that each of them has a gift and has these talents, these creative, um, creative nature that needs to come out, and for them to nurture that so that they can recognize it and nurture it in their students. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to teach creativity when you don't realize that you are creative yourself. So that's kind of um, been my push and my, my little, you know, my feather in my cap when I, when I go out and teach. Um, these students, and I feel very blessed to be able to do that. Um, <clears throat> as I was saying, I think creativity and differentiated instruction, it's just a perfect match. I don't think you can successfully um, differentiate uh, in a classroom without having um, 
a knowledge of, of creativity and um, you know the four areas that we, we all know so well as the four P's. Um, so I think in order to you know move beyond um, what we know and coming out of, a, out of this program and to be able to find that niche is to really understand it in ourselves and really um, take the time to, to figure out what it is that we have to offer so that we can um, instill it in our, in our students and in our colleagues and in our family members, the people around us. Um, as far as the things that were hardest and um, easiest, the hardest came to my mind first, I think, going through this, the program, even though it was um, literally life-changing for me. Um, it sort of came a time in my life where I needed that change, but um, it was a drastic change, and everything seemed to sort of go upside down. Um, <laughs> I, I took a leave of absence to get my finish my master's, and I had just had a baby, and everything was everything was <laughs> crazy. Um, but it was really a turning point in my life, and um, it just it makes me think of um, Robert Fritz and the whole you know the gap, the fuzzy part, you know, before you get to that desired state. And I truly believe that you know you need to have that vision. You need to be able to to see where you want to be, and that makes that fuzziness a little bit more. Um, you know, that you can handle it a little bit better. It's, uh, it's frustrating, mm -hmm. and it's, it's that chaos, it's that gap that you, you feel intensely, and um, it's a physical thing. But I think um, the joy comes in um, the abundance that comes out of that. You know, we're not growing, we're not changing, we're not um, doing anything positively, changing positively, unless we, we go through that. So I guess it's, it's learning how to you know, just deal with it a little bit because you know the good stuff's going to come at the end. Can I so, add something? Please. Kara brings up a really good point, and I think it's something that I remember being a student going through the program, and then after uh, graduation, just kind of happened to start a business. I don't know how that happened. But anyway, um, you, you tend to think that, okay, so now I've learned this, and you try to kind of very rigidly overlay that on everything and everybody, and you don't really find yourself, which I think is mm -hmm. where you were going, Kara. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very important that you give yourself the opportunity to um, become who you are with the process and find your niche because we're all different. Uh, if we all uh, went off you know, into the next room and each facilitated a group, we would do it very differently. We follow the same process, but our styles are different. Personalities are different, expectations and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I just think, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no. I'm I just think that's a very important uh, piece. And for me, it took a while because I kept trying, I kept thinking, well, you know, I have to be like Roger. I have to be like <laughs> Sue. I have to be like Gerard. Well, it, they're all wonderful. <clears throat> But, you but nobody to wants you. to be like us. <laughs> yeah, nobody <laughs> wants to be like us. Uh, but you, you have to find your niche and your way of, you know, delivering the message and working the process. So thank and you for bringing that up. Absolutely. And that, that's such a good point, you know, because we, we leave the program feeling, I mean, I, I felt this sense of loss when I had, when I had to graduate, yeah. you know, as mm -hmm. much as I wanted to get out there. It's like, oh, my God, what am I going to do now, you know? And then the obvious would be to become, oh, well, I love to facilitate because it's so much fun, so let's, let's be Roger. And so I, and you, you know, did. I connected with yeah, Roger. Would, and, yeah. Oh, I did too. Uh, yeah, and I thought this, was, this is it. This is what I, you know, uh, this is my niche. And um, I started my own consulting business, and, um, you know, and I still am consulting on the side, but um, that's really what it had to be on the side because... <laughs> No money was coming. <laughs> and what I realized soon, it wasn't about the money. It was about um, I'm not a business-minded person, nor do I really want to be. And so, you know, what you see all finished and perfect, you know, he's been honing that for years and years, as have, you know, the faculty. Um, and, but, but in the process, I just realized that wasn't, that wasn't me. You know, I didn't like to have to sell myself. You know, I didn't like to have to um, worry about where the next paycheck was going to come. And, um, you know, not to say that it, it wouldn't have eventually, but I didn't have time, on, you know, to invest in that and money at that point. Um, but it, it's interesting because once I actually said it out loud and I said, I, you know, this isn't for me. This isn't, this isn't the path I need to go. It's not a failure because, wow, I started my own business. How cool is that? You know, I can say that I did that, and um, you know, and it was a 
phone call to Sue, and I just said, all right, I, I think this isn't for me, but, you know, maybe I need to start teaching again. Because it's my, you know, that's my love as well. And it just sort of connected, and this other thing happened about. But I think I had to understand that about myself, yes. and I had to close that door, you know, proverbial, the window will open, you know. But you have to, you have to, um, you have to trust yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. As well as the process, right? As well as the process. <laughs> right. Right. I wrote that too. Trust the process. It was a good thing yeah. of trusting the process. But I think where I came from, um, I was a teacher when I <clears throat> entered the master's program. And I already knew certain things about myself. I knew that I, want, I was a teacher who wanted to teach kids to be better thinkers. And I might teach them math and social studies and science. I was a second grade teacher. Um, but it, uh, that, the math and social studies and science is what they were thinking about. I wanted them to be good thinkers. And that's how I got into the program. I ended up talking to Scott and Roger and a couple of other people that this is the program for me because this is really what it's all about. And then I ended up getting into gift education. But it's all about helping kids become self-directed learners, helping kids think at a higher level and that whole idea that it's, it's not about, they're not just born being able to think. They can think, but how do we use it? Yes. And it Excellent. was actually Michael Curtin. Uh, we were in a, um, <laughs> we having dinner one time, and Michael Curtin joined us. And he told the story that I'll never forget. And he said, um, if you're walking at night and you think someone's behind you or you think something's behind you, would you turn around and stare where you think the, the um, person might be, or would you look from side to side? And, I didn't know I said, I'd probably turn around and stare. He said, no, actually your night vision is better if you look from side to side. So he said, you already had that ability, but you, you didn't know that about your ability. Mm -hmm. And that was the good analogy for, yeah. that's what we can do as teachers, is we can teach kids and graduate students um, and, and other adults how to use the thinking that they have. And mm -hmm. like you're saying with creativity, um, we all have creativity, but to what level? And a lot of teachers, I do a lot of training with differentiated instruction and teacher centers all over, and um, creativity is the biggest piece that people don't have. Mm -hmm. We talk about differentiating, we talk about teaching higher level thinking, we can teach knowledge, we can teach them learning to learn skills, how do you remember? Mm -hmm. How do you control your attention? How do you control your attitude? Those kind of things for knowledge. And we can teach them about critical thinking, but when it gets to the creative thinking, that's when teachers don't have strategies. Mm -hmm. They don't know what to do with kids who are creative in their classroom. Kids who have right. a creative preference, they don't know what to do because they don't feel comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. But to give them a few skills, no matter what I'm teaching, I always throw in those creativity mm -hmm. skills. Um, and it's not the process. I'm not teaching the process. Right. I'm teaching yeah. them, well, try scamper. Mm -hmm. Or try, you know, brainstorming, what are the rules for that and why does it work and what does, um, you know, mean to defer judgment and those kind of things. So I think that no matter what I'm doing, whether someone's asking me to teach differentiated instruction or multiple intelligences or what is it now, um, I don't know, if it's data, team, formative assessment, I don't know, it just keeps changing what it is they want me to teach. No matter what I'm teaching, <laughs> right. I always throw in the learning to learn and creative skills because that's the part that all the teachers come back and say, that was most valuable to me. I still use it. Or they'll see me years and years later and say, I still use this or I mm -hmm. still use that. And it's these creative thinking skills mm -hmm. and all of the little the techniques that help people become the creative person that they are. Mm -hmm. that, that's what really makes the difference. So that's how I use it in my everyday teaching with no matter what I'm doing. I think the hardest part for me was actually, like you were saying, going through the program. It was a long time ago for me, and I had both of my babies at the time when I was going through my master's program. So I had two infants working full time. But I did it, and you get through. It feels good when you're done, but you get so much knowledge in having friends like Sue and Gerard, and Gerard went through the program with us too. Mm -hmm. at, and that's what got us through. We worked together. We collaborated with each other. And um, 
it, it was a great journey, but it was very difficult to get through, especially that project at the end. <laughs> no, mm -hmm. I'm not, you're not going to give up. You persevere. You just do what you have to do, and you get done, whether you have babies crying at home right. or not. You just <laughs> right. you have to do it. On your lap. You know? right. <laughs> you just do it. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest challenge right now is when I first graduated, creativity was coming up and coming, and, and we were getting it in schools, and it was great. And then along came NCLB. And all of a sudden, teachers thought they needed to teach for the test. And so I don't have time for that creativity fluff stuff anymore. And so that's the biggest challenge now is to get them, now and now they're more and more accountable for those tests, to get them to see that if you teach for creative thinking and if you teach for critical thinking and if you teach up here, they're going to do better on the tests. Mm -hmm. But if you teach directly to the test, they're not teaching them how to think better. They're just teaching them, I don't know, are you, are you memorizing more stuff? Mm -hmm so that you can take this test. But I think that that's our biggest challenge in education is to convince everyone that if we teach up here, the kids will do well on the test because it's about logical thinking and all of those things. And we can teach them, those, those creative kids that say, well, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. Mm -hmm. We'll teach them how to, you know, don't use your creative thinking when you're taking a multiple choice test. You know? Right. <laughs> right. You know, use your creative thinking for this, but not this. And this is when you need it. Right. And we can teach them that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's our biggest challenge. Well, one thing that uh, comes to my mind is, and probably because I work so much with um, uh, the workforce um, in general, one of the biggest challenges, one of the biggest disconnects that I keep hearing from employers is the whole idea that um, uh, um, folks that are trying to enter the workplace, whether they're right from high school or, you know, um, they're coming from another job or just in general that they don't have some of the basic skills and some of those basic skills are thinking skills mm -hmm. you know right now when we look at it we are in a global economy this is not you know I'm not competing with Kara mm -hmm. right next to me you know I'm competing with um, you know someone in China or you know um, Korea, Greece or India. wherever <laughs> exactly and so those those aren't there so I, I think to Nancy's point we really were doing them a, a disservice by not teaching those you know in the classroom those are so valuable and just critical mm -hmm. once they you know once they get into the workplace mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how you do it <laughs> but there is a that disconnect mm -hmm. Well, I think we have the how-to of it, but it's convincing everyone of the necessity of it, and um, of letting of them letting go of. I'm, I've got to get my students ready for this regents test. Yes, you do, but um, right. it's not an either no. or, yeah. and that's right. what they yeah. think sometimes. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right, and maybe it's it's that satisfying this immediate need versus looking at it globally. What do these um, students need as I prepare them for? Um, either higher education or the workplace, or because let's face it, eventually you get out of school and you got to go to work, and so these, you know, these are very, very important. Mm -hmm. Seems very typical of um, the Western thinking too. I mean, you know, with the continuous improvement, just reminds mm -hmm. me of the, you know, the Eastern philosophies yes. of just in the workplace, and uh, is it kaizen? Is yes, continuous we have kaizen events. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I think um, we're just trained to think, you know like the big idea, the big bang, the big, you know, we need it now, we need it yesterday, right. and there's no, you know, patience for, well, mm -hmm. if we do it this way, you know, there's going to be long-term, mm -hmm. you know, improvement. Well, and, yeah, I can't tell you how many organizations come in and want us to train their people on problem solving. They may not e accept uh, the creative problem solving, but they really need their folks to be able to come to a solution. They need for them to recognize a problem and then, you know, get to a solution. And certainly the CPS is the best way to do it. Um, but uh, when we, when we um, deliver continuous improvement, you mentioned Kaizen. That's part of uh, lean training. I don't know if anyone's heard of lean and Six Sigma. Okay. It's part of that training. And we have to start at the very beginning. Um, I, I can't remember which of the ladies talked about that, but people aren't necessarily born with good problem-solving skills. Like, they're not born with great thinking skills or great listening skills or what have you. So we really, when we do that, we go into organizations, we're forced to start at the very beginning because mm -hmm. um, they, they don't have those skills. 